years in millions of homes. A man loved a woman, a child it was born. It learned how to hurt and it learned how to cry like humans do. Hi, I'm Tommy Rocket, and welcome to the 197th Tommy Rocket Show. I'm here today with a great topic and with Dr. Barbara Roberts. She's the former director of the Women's Cardiac Center at the Miriam Hospital and author of many books. Marianne Sorrentino, journalist and former executive director of Planned Parenthood in Rhode Island. And of course, my co-host Peter Phipps and the plenty potentiary of the Tommy Rocket Show and journalism instructor at URI. We have a great topic today. The topic is the history of Planned Parenthood and the fight for choice in Rhode Island. Peter put together a great outline for us and it's gonna be a very interesting conversation. Peter, tell us how we're going to begin here today. Well, uh it's interesting. This is we're almost at 50 years of some events here that are that are happening uh, in the choice movement, and so I thought it'd be great to go back to, back to the roots and to go back to the roots with the two of you personally. So, uh, uh, Barbara, you I've read in your book the Doctor Broad. Uh, you grew up in a sort of a strict. Catholic home. And there, I was the oldest of 10 children in a devout Irish Catholic family. My parents were uh, part of the Catholic Worker Movement. Now, the Catholic Worker Movement was founded by Dorothy Day, a radical Catholic pacifist who I think has since been canonized. But they were, um, they were very devout. And they and their other uh, friends who were in the Catholic Workers' Movement wanted to raise their children away from the temptations of the big city, the big city in this case being New York. So they pooled their meager resources and they founded what was basically a left-wing Catholic commune called Marycrest in what was then called the suburb, the country, but it's now called the suburbs in Rockland County, New York, and they called this community Marycrest. And so I was raised by a father whose favorite expression was, rally round your priests blindly. Now, now, Marianne, how similar was your childhood as far as the church is concerned? Well, and we'll get back to Barbara. My mother was one of seven, six children, and she had a brother who was a Dominican priest at Providence College, and he kind of set the tone when he was present. But thank God he wasn't at our house much. And my parents, um, my father had actually been forced into the seminary when his parents both died and my his aunt, his oldest sister, was left in charge of five children. So she put them all in convents and seminaries to get some peace and quiet. But he and the others just said, I'm not staying here. So I grew up in a Catholic, in, with parents of Catholic upbringing. But fortunately for me, there was not this devout thing going on. And although I think none of them would have wanted not to be married in the church or buried from the church, they weren't banging you over the head with it every minute. But in your case, uh, Barbara, and I, I guess it's not that unusual, your sort of turning from the faith, they might say, started with contraception or? It started with contraception. Right. I. I realized at a young age that my mother's life and the life of the other Mary Crest women was very difficult. As I said, my mother had 10 children in 10 years That's and three months. That's no contraception, and, no, right? And I was, I was like the co-mother. I would say I raised nine before I had my own three. And so I, I decided that I wanted to have a life as far removed from my mother's as it was possible to get. Now, my, pre, my father worshipped priests and doctors. I knew I didn't have a prayer of becoming a priest, so I decided to become a doctor <laughs> at a time when that was a very unusual uh, ambition for a girl, at a time when there were quotas in medical school admissions. No class could have more than 10% women. This is really? the, the late 50s we're talking about? Yes, so I, 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 was, uh, I graduated grammar school in 57, high school in 61. Mm -hmm. That's when I started college. So um, it, was, it was, you were sort of looked at askance when you said you wanted to become a doctor. Yes. Uh, but it was probably the wisest decision I made as a young woman, but in medical school. So I left the church because I knew that, and I got married right after college. Actually, I got married just before my first year of medical school. I'd done college in three years. And um, I knew that I was going to use birth control after I had to go off the pill and I got pregnant. 
and I knew once my daughter was born that I was going to go, that I was going to continue with medical school, which I did, and I was going to use birth control. So I initially left the church over birth control, right. but then when I was in medical school, I saw things that radicalized me. I saw right. women so let's coming jump to, to hospital that. with perforated wombs in septic shock, even partially disemboweled. This is 1967. This is 1967. Right. So this is the point that people mention all the time, and Mary and I've read you, people forget right yeah. what it was like so what Septics. was it so what was this like so it, it was horrifying I mean I knew of a woman who died because she was denied what should have been a legal abortion even though abortion was illegal you could do abortions to save the life of the mother she had terminal heart disease and terminal liver disease and at the hospital when the medical service asked for a consultation to the OBGYN service so that they, she could yeah. get a legal abortion they made sure it was presented to only Catholic obstetricians mm. so this it would is be in denied. your book I believe right yes yeah. so she died mm. in the later stages of pregnancy because she was denied a therapeutic abortion and, and these these experiences that I went through as a young, uh, you know, medical student radicalized me. And when, that, when I was a resident at Yale, I was moonlighting at Yale Student Health, taking, and I saw several patients who were female law students at Yale, and they told me they were bringing a class action suit against the Connecticut bo abortion laws. And I became friendly with them, and they asked me to be the medical coordinator of the suit. Right. Uh, now, uh, Marianne, in, in uh, I, I guess I read somewhere, uh, you had a roommate who right. had an ab abortion in college or something? What, right. uh, tell me about that. And, you know, I had kind of the opposite experience of Barbara. Even though my parents weren't super religious, they were, they were Catholic and they took it seriously, but they didn't pound you with it every day. So I had, and I went to Elmhurst, which is a private school in Rhode Island run by the Madams of the Sacred Heart. It was on Smith Street, the, I think. Well, it used to be, uh, yes, on Smith Street. The next Madams to the of the Sacred Heart? Yes, You're being is. facetious there. No, no, no. That, that no, was what they were called? Because it was a French <laughs> order, and it was Les Mesdames ah, de Sacré right. Cœur. Okay. Uh. So and they, they like to be referred to that way. And it was a very um, elite order. You had to bring a dowry of so much money to become a nun in that order, and if you had less money than that, so that's you could, old school. You right. could become a member, but you became the one that cleaned the... the convent and cook the meals. And so those were these called, were the nuns the upper, that And educated. actually, the last, the last head of the uh, uh, Sacred Heart School in Rhode Island was Grover Whalen's daughter, and she ended up teaching at Salve, as, you know, now without the habit and all mm -hmm. that thing, but she was, a, uh, and, and she, that went on up until recently. So it, it's a very weird order. So your roommate was a So, no, that was, so that's where college. I went to high school. And then I go to college at Elmira, New York, because I want to get as far away from that Catholic thing as I was, as I could. And um, I went to junior year abroad, and my roommate was this hot number from New York. And when I knew that I was going to be assigned to live with her, I was still provincial enough to think, I can't live with someone like this. So I went to the dean. Now, when you say hot number, what do you mean by that? She had already slept with like three guys. I barely I knew see. how to put my shoes on at mm -hmm. that point. So I'm, <laughs> it was a new world for me. So I went to the dean and said, I can't be roommates with this one. She said, why? Now, I'm not going to tell her. She's a fast number. So I just said, <laughs> well, we're not. We, we're too different. And it's going to be. And she said, no, that's, you're not giving me a good enough reason. So I go to Florence, mm -hmm. and she's my roommate. And sure enough, one day she comes home to announce that she's pregnant. Now at that point I'm saying, well, you have to have the baby. No, I'm not having the baby. And we have the baby and we'll give it up for adoption. No, no, no. I did all the right to life answers. You were counseling? Yes. Wow. No, I mean, <laughs> I wasn't even going near the word abortion. And she finally announced that she wasn't going to do any of this, that she was going to have an abortion. And I said, well, you're on your own. I'm, I'm not, I can't be She was going to do this in Europe. Florence. You're on but your this, own. I can't help you. Do or do I want to help you? Or no, something I said, like yeah, that. I'm not going to. You yeah. know. And mm -hmm. so she, you know, women seeking to terminate a pregnancy are among the most creative and determined women at that moment because they, they aren't going to do this and they're going to make sure they find a way out. And she managed to find in Florence uh, a doctor and she went off uh, and her boyfriend, later husband, whom I actually like very much, but he called me and said, would you go with Lisa? And I said, no, this is your responsibility. You go, you're supposed to go. Mm. So he did have to go and I didn't go. But um, I worried that whole day when she wasn't coming home that something would happen. Mm. But I was worrying selfishly because I was saying to myself, if she dies and hemorrhages on this table, 
uh, wherever she is, and the college calls me, I'm going to be responsible because she's my roommate, and I knew about, you know, we had all that buddy system with you were guilty if you didn't tell the dean what somebody else did, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, thank God she came through that, and um, you know, nothing bad happened to this her. This was in the 60s? 1963. Right. So uh, back to 50 years ago, in our, in our way back machine, uh, you, f you helped form a national organization, Barbara. Yes. Um, Let's just back up a little. So I became the uh, medical coordinator for a lawsuit called right. uh, popularly Women versus Connecticut. Mm -hmm. The official name was Abili versus Markle, and we were bringing a class action suit against the Connecticut abortion laws. And I was being asked to speak. In fact, the first place I spoke publicly about abortion was in front of the Connecticut legislature, which was considering some slight liberalization of the Connecticut abortion laws. And so I said to myself, in for a penny, in for a pound. And I got there, and they had bust in loads of Catholic school children <laughs> to these hearings. Mm. So I started by saying, a popular medical dictionary defines disease as literally a lack of ease, and venereal disease as one usually acquired through sexual intercourse. It is apparent, therefore, that unwanted pregnancy is the most common venereal disease. You, you said this in, to I Connecticut this in, in 1970. The Connecticut legislature. Right, okay. I said it, it is associated with immense physical, mental, social, and economic suffering. In seeking to be cured of this disease, women throughout history have risked pain, mutilation, and death in numbers that stagger the imagination. Mm. Today, when the cure for this venereal disease is statistically safer than carrying that pregnancy to term, Abortion is still widely withheld by antiquated laws and religious tenets not shared by the majority of people. Now, this is a speech you've I'm and, giving, and, a, and meanwhile, and you've, you I'm gave giving, this 50 years ago, and you've given yeah, it multiple times since. <laughs> right. So I, I continued, but you know, my speech was interrupted multiple times by all these Catholic school kids booing. And <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, some women who I later found out were actually members of the Socialist Workers Party found out about this class action lawsuit and they called a meeting in New York to start a national um, movement to legalize abortion because we knew that the Supreme Court was hearing Roe v. Wade mm. shortly. And so I was one of the organizers of this conference in New York, and we founded a group called the Women's National Abortion Action Coalition, and we actually organized the first national pro-choice demonstration, which took place in Washington, D.C. on November 21st, 1971, 50 years ago next month. Right. Now, Connecticut legislature talk was in the spring of 71, so I've been at this more than 50 years, right. and I'll probably Mary die Ann, doing it. You've got were you at that any of these demonstrations that oh, yeah. Barbara organized? Uh, I yes, I I went to Washington and marched and uh, in seventy one you know, in November seventy one. I yes. wasn't yet at Planned Parenthood or right. any of that stuff, but no, I I got the message after you know the experience with yes, my roommate. Yes, in Florence. And, yeah. yeah. And so so we're gonna we're gonna take a break soon, but so what we'll start our next segment. We'll talk about Roe Wade, um, but. An interesting it, source, it's still in the news all the time, it, and, and yet it's not, it's certainly not a settled issue because we're talking about 50 years ago and the things that Barbara's talking about, she happy. gave in a speech in October of 2021 in the State House in Providence. It basically the same speech you gave in Connecticut 50 years earlier, right? Very similar. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, we're coming to the end of the first segment, so uh, stay tuned and we'll be back. I propose three cheers for those we leave behind. Congratulations. <laughs> Good job. Congratulations. Proud of you. All right. Anson Elliott. Who's going to salute him? Guys, who gets to salute him first?
Hi, and welcome back to the second segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. As you know, we're here with Barbara Roberts, Marion Sorrentino, and Peter Phipps. Peter, where did we leave off? We left in the early 70s, so let's get to Roe Wade. Uh, the Supreme Court, as you were alluding to, ruled, and, um, and uh, you know, a lot of people would have said that was it for this issue, but that's obviously it wasn't. But Marianne, if you want to, if you, what, what was it like to get abortions before and after Roe Wade in Rhode Island, before and after Planned Parenthood? Well, Planned Parenthood has been around since 19, the 1930s in Rhode Island, so, uh, but they weren't providing abortions. However, I'm sure that there must have been a network because wherever people like that who are providing... A referral network. Right. Yes. Right. So how so, did the referral network work in well, the neighborhoods of Providence? I, I was born in 43, so I, I don't know, but I, what the folklore is... Uh, there were doctors, and the one that I have heard the most about is a female physician who um, provided abortions. Uh, her husband was also a physician out of a house that they had in Providence, and um, it was a pretty well-known fact. But even a woman as uh, I would call my grandmother provincial, she never really spoke English, though she was here for many years, she was very lovely quiet woman, and even once someone asked her about uh, pregnancy that they didn't want. And my grandmother started this speech about, well, if you go to such and which a drugstore, they have this black medicine, I don't know what it was. But you know, there was some, uh, there's all this folkloric stuff that goes on. Mm -hmm. Women have always managed to figure out ways to not have children that they don't want to have. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, if you insist on talking about this, just understand that you might as well go talk to that wall. If the woman doesn't want to have this child, she's not having it. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't need anybody else's permission or mm -hmm. help. It's, it's a do-it-yourself job. It's not easy, but that's what happens. And not always safe, obviously. It's not always safe. And that's why when enough people started dying, hemorrhaging, and whatever, whatever, people finally understood that women are just not going to be forced into having babies that they don't want to have. So reasonable people said we need to do what needs to be done. Right, so we have Roe Wade uh, and Planned Parenthood what, the, you were director in 77? Yes. And, so. and what was going on in 77? We had, were there abortions regularly being done in 77? Yes. Right. There was a wonderful female medical director, Dr. Lydia Maria Nunez. Maria Lydia, actually, she liked it that way. Nunez. And her husband was also a physician. He was a psychiatrist. And she was by herself with her staff providing these uh, surgeries. And uh, then several other doctors came in who were subcontractors. They didn't work there full time. Lydia was full time, obviously. And so we had a, a good gang of people who worked for us part time. The, the were physicians. you on Point Street at that time? Um, no, when I went there, no, they didn't start the abortions till they had already moved downtown. I don't believe they did them on Point Street yet. Um, no, they, we, when I worked they, there, they, when Point you Street. were my boss, yeah. and we were doing them downtown. Yeah, that's where, what I'm saying. Where, in a building downtown? or We, we were at, right on Westminster Mall, Planned Parenthood, when I was the director. It was right upstairs over, what the hell was downstairs? Across from where the Boston store was. This is really Rhode Island. Oh, that's right, <laughs> the mall. But anyway, one of the last buildings on Westminster before you get to Dorrance. That's where we were on the third floor. Near the piano store? No, I that's way Boston. Oh, we that's Boston. way Boston. Right. No, Westminster. No, no. Westminster. Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So then... Um, so Marianne, you hired Barbara? No, I think you were already working there. I didn't hire you. I don't I, no, I think I started, no, because I only came to Rhode Island in 77, and I didn't start working at Planned Parenthood until I met Ben Sturgis, which was oh, probably okay. 78. Okay, so ben was ben, a big benefactor. Of, right, okay. He's an old Yankee. National yeah. Planned Parenthood board member. Yeah, he, he was a descendant of Dr. Benjamin Rush, the Revolutionary War mm -hmm. physician, and um, I took care of some family members, and when he heard that I had been trained in doing abortions, he said, oh, I want to, I'm going to put you in touch with Planned Parenthood. And so I started working, I think, at Planned Parenthood in 1978, okay, then before I'm we moved to Point Street. I didn't know I hired you. I'm smarter than I think. Were you at Miriam Hospital then also? Yes. Yeah. And, and how many physicians were performing abortions at, at that time? We yes, had, I mean, at Planned Parenthood. Yeah, we had a good number. I mean, like four maybe uh -huh. at the most, not Wasn't a lot. There a clinic they, on Federal Hill on Atwell's too? Or that something? was that much was, later. That was Anthony Minocchio. 
Dr. Anthony Minocchio. But that wasn't until when? The 90s? Probably not till the, maybe the, no, the 80s. 80s. Yeah. It was the 80s. The 80s, yeah. right. At the time, I think we, there was that women's center or women's something else club. Wasn't Jack DiOrio? That was Jack DiOrio, but yeah. that was still later because Jack used to work for me. So we had about, I can remember on the top of my head, like five or six doctors, including Barbara. Right. And, um, Not so all at once. But now let's get to the Catholic Church. That's up to you. Um, I read that your papers from your excommunication are in the Brown John Hay Library. And well, they should be because right. they're very educational. Yeah. So what are what are in, what what is, it's your correspondence? Mm. It's is it media? What what what? Is, oh, I think it what's was in that selection. It, it was such a circus when this excommunication happened. You know, because the questions that I was asking at the time of the diocese was, well, okay, so what about all the doctors who are Catholic that perform the abortions? Are they excommunicated too? Silence. <laughs> you know, it was ridiculous. Are you talking to Jelano at this time? No, Jelano does, didn't ever have the guts to talk to me. Yes. Uh, I wasn't even told officially. The way I found out that I was excommunicated was on a television show, from one that. of those wacky right. two priest brothers that had the TV show, right. announcing that I was the public like enemy one. number one yeah. of That's the unborn. Called. They yeah. called you that? Yeah. yeah. Now, Barbara, uh, you were excommunicated? Yes. I don't remember the details, but I, I was um, very active in the pro-choice movement. I, at the time, I was working for the National Institutes of Health, and I, I became friendly with a woman named Carol Burris who uh, founded something called the Feminist Lobby, and she was work lobbying hard for the Equal Rights Amendment, but she was also an ex-Catholic, and she said, you know what, we should, we should bring a lawsuit against the Catholic Church for lobbying, um, for being lobbyists when they're not paying any taxes, because you're, you're supposed to right. not lobby if you were. Not supposed to be political. So uh, I don't remember the details, but you know, we talked about this, and it got into the news, and so the Catholic Church um, their response was, well, they're both excommunicated. But I never got any official papers. I mean, maybe they said the thing and I threw them out. Cause I no, I didn't get any papers either. I, I didn't get any papers either. Now you, just you tell the story, and I read somewhere, um, about your daughter coming for confirmation. Yeah, and you know, it's funny you should ask about that, because uh, it, because there's this woman who's making a movie about all this, and I was going over all my stuff in my computer. And I actually forgot that I had saved on my computer the audio of that interview of the priest with my daughter and and my husband and I were The there. movie maker must have been overjoyed. Well, she that. hasn't heard it yet, but oh. yeah, I found it and I, so I could send it to her. I couldn't believe it again. When I was listening to it again, it's the kind of thing that makes me want to reach into the computer and grab the guy and strangle him if I could, because it was so cruel and unnecessary and What stupid. had he said, to, may I ask you, what had he asked your daughter? Here she was, a, a t young teenager, not even dating boys or taking phone calls from boys, as far as I know, at that point. And he, I think she was 13. And he wants to know um, if if she's um, if she got pregnant, would she have an abortion, for example? She was 13. Yeah. Mm. And this was in the church. No, no. Well, this was in his office. Yeah. Oh. This was in the 80s, right? Yeah, 19. Uh, I was at Planned Parenthood 1977 to 1987, so yeah. it was some time. She, well, if she was 13, she was born in 69, you do the math. 82. <laughs> yeah. mm. So uh, now I, I read, I, I, I'm you know, looking around the internet, and I found the story about your excommunication. I think this is in the Brown piece, and the day you got communion. What did the woman bring? Yes, to yeah, me? yeah. Tell, okay. tell, tell that story from the beginning. You had right. already been excommunicated. Yes. And, you know, I'm not a hypocrite. I wasn't the best Catholic that, you know, God ever made. I wasn't like always in church or going to do novenas and stuff like that. I, I went to church most Sundays. And um, I even went to confession before I'd go to communion because I felt that if I wanted communion, I ought to go as purely as I can be. So I didn't mind all that. So I was like most Catholics, I think, you know, ordinary Catholics, not fanatics. And um, what, was, what was your, what did you want me to really So continue? I want to tell the story that you, if you're excommunicated, oh, getting you're, the you can go getting, to mass, but okay, you right. can't get communion, right? Well, okay. But then it got to a point where whenever I would be in a Catholic church, because of all this stuff that was in the paper about the excommunication, like if I went to a wedding or a funeral, the people would spend more time looking at me and 
<laughs> than do, paying attention to the mess. So that got to be uncomfortable. So at the time, there was this really progressive Catholic group that used to have a mass on Sunday in La Salle Academy. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what the name of the group was, but I, I asked if I could come. And they said, sure. So I would come down from, we lived in North Providence at the time, and I would always sit in the back, because I was always aware that it was uncomfortable for some people, and especially for this poor priest who's saying this mass, he'd probably get nailed because he let me in there. So I used to just sit in the back by myself. And um, one, I, I never went to the rail. I, I never felt that I should, because again, it creates the stir in the building, you know. She's supposed to do. This. She's not supposed to do that. You know, whatever. So one Sunday, I was in the back, sitting by myself as I usually did, and this wonderful woman came from the rail, with the host, because the priest, as you know now, can hold, hand you the host. He doesn't have to put it on your tongue. You can actually touch it, which we didn't used to be able to do. So she carried this host down the aisle to the back of the church where I was, and she broke it in half, and gave me her half, which is really what communion is all about. Mm. Wow, that's a great story. Um, now, when did the church start standing on the sidewalk in front of your office and, and organizing those demonstrations? Well, you know, I think it, it would be unfair to say the church organized all those all the time. I mean, many of the people who are involved in that were um, devout Catholics. I don't have any evidence that there was official, you know, Diocese of Providence involvement in those things, mm -hmm. but it's the product of the people that who are so right. close to them. I, I, so I misspoke. I, yeah, no, I, I, you can, but I, I don't want to because it, it puts me in a worse position than I'm in, because it's not true, and I don't lie. So, um, d because frankly, my experience is that most priests that I met along the way. Because I, you know, I continued to go to confession and be a Catholic. Mm. And most priests are not as bad as these fanatical right to life people, so called. Because mm -hmm. they're fanatics. And um, so it's very hard to talk to them because you can't reason with them. And they don't want to hear anything that's reasonable. Right. But I've seen the bishop on the sidewalk, walking my dog and things. Yeah, you mean in, the current the, bishop? Yes. I don't know Bishop Tobin. I haven't had the displeasure of meeting him. <laughs> but, um, you know, at the time it was Bishop Jelano when I was doing mm -hmm. this. And frankly, he's afraid of his own shadow because he's got his own stuff to worry about. So um, he really wasn't ever dictatorial about this issue. But the scene on the sidewalk was from of a certain danger. It presented some danger, didn't it? Well, the very fact that we have male picketers, and that's why we had escorts. We had men who volunteered to protect the staff from the picketers. Right, mm -hmm. and uh -huh. the fact that you had to do that. Yeah. Oh, you know, and it was around this time that certain abortion clinics were being attacked and bombed even. And bombed, yes. And I remember my youngest woke up in the middle of the night once and came into my bedroom crying. I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? She said, Mommy, I don't want you to die in an abortion clinic bombing. That's a fair fear of a child, yeah. I would say. And so, so it's I all to the media. I tried to reassure What's her true about also. how it was unlikely. We were still downtown at that point. You know, mm -hmm. it was unlikely to happen. Um, but, you know, my life was threatened. I mean, people told me that, you know, I was a murderer and deserved to mm -hmm. die. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one woman wrote, <laughs> Attila the Hun would be proud of you. <laughs> wrote you a note no. or something? Yeah. yeah. So uh, well, we're coming up on a break, right? Coming up to the break because we've got just seconds left. We've come to the end of the second segment, so please stay tuned. And we'll come back with the third segment and our esteemed guest. So stay tuned. <laughs> Hi, and welcome back to the third segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. You know we're here with uh, Barbara Roberts, Marion Sorrentino, and Peter Phipps. Peter, where did we leave off last time? Well, with, I think I think we left off with, with sort of skipping clinic. over Roe Wade, and uh, which is from 1973, 
and um, I think if, what, what, would, what did you think when that happened? Did you think this was a new day, that we were entering into a time of when the fight was done and uh, it was going to be sweet sailing? Well, first of all, I hadn't come to Planned Parenthood yet. In 1973, I was doing other work. I wasn't running a Planned Parenthood right. affiliate. There you are. So it, it came to me as news that was important, as it did for most men and women in this country. And still is in the paper, and, in the news, right. every day yes. in America today. You hear Roe v. Wade. And mm -hmm. it's, it, it is probably one of the most important, if not the most important, law to impact on women's freedom. The, the Roe v. Wade decision, we knew in 1971 that the Supreme Court was going to hear arguments in, in Roe v. Wade. And the Supreme Court doesn't make decisions in a vacuum. So Wonak and other pro-choice uh, groups held demonstrations and teach-ins and lectures and, and multiple events all around the country for those two years. And when the decision came down on January 22, 1973, I, we all breathe this a sigh of relief. I mean, I was already doing abortions at the preterm clinic in Washington, D.C., because Washington, like New York City, had legalized abortion. Mm -hmm. But now we knew that women would be able to get abortions in their home states. Mm -hmm. I, being, having been raised a Catholic, I thought that there would be pushback. But I never thought it would get to the point where doctors who provided abortions would be murdered. Mm. Um, that doctors would be charged, like Dr. Ken Edelin, I'm sure you remember, was charged with manslaughter for doing a 24-week abortion in um, Boston, even after Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. He was eventually acquitted. Um, and I didn't foresee that in one eight-year period between 2011 and 2019, there would be 483 restrictions restrictive laws introduced in various state legislatures, that. most of which the Supreme Court have, have, have upheld. And I think that long before the Texas law that was recently passed, abortion was not available in wide swaths of the country. Right, right, right. And I fear very much now that with this Supreme Court, which is heavily stacked with conservative anti-choice justices, that Roe v. Wade will be overturned. So it, it um, and it, it, well, part of the thing with Roe v. Wade is that states have some latitude to set standards and, right. and, and obviously with the hundreds and hundreds of laws that have passed, set restrictions that has made, have made large parts of the country uh, have made abortion unavailable. Uh, and in Rhode Island, it got very serious in 86 with Proposition 14. 14. Um, and you were right at the forefront of that fight, Marianne. So well, take us back yeah. to that time and, and it, it... Were you it, still at Planned Parenthood then? It was the last great moment I had. I left in 87. Right. Oh. Um, but it, it was an exciting time though because we I think, you know, clearly it was a threat, and we needed to fight against it and hope that we would win. But somewhere in us there was this real conviction that we couldn't lose this, that we were going to win. Because it's like unringing a bell. Uh, it would be very difficult for any state to go from abortion on demand to, no, you can't have it at all here. Um, and I think that the politicians in Rhode Island, they're not the brightest bulb in the circuit all the time, but they know when something is going to turn around and bite them in the butt, and they knew that about this. So let's just tell us a little bit more of Proposition 14. Briefly, it, it restricted abortion in a serious sort of way? That well, it, This is post-Roe Wade. Yeah, it, what it did was they were, as you remember, it was a constitutional convention. Right. And they were trying to put language into the Constitution that would have at best limited abortion and at, I mean at best for them uh, done away with the possibility and at the at the worst uh, for them but the best for us that it would have some you know restrictions that would make it harder to get fortunately it didn't happen right and there was also a contraceptive there was a f something about limiting certain kinds of contraceptions no In yeah that because they they have there are certain contraceptions that they consider abortifacients the uh, IUD yeah I see. Making, it prevents the implantation of a fertilized egg ah 
so. from traveling on down the canal or whatever. Well, it, it can travel down the fallopian tubes, but it can't implant in the I wall see, of the uterus. It can't get out, right. Or well, it can't implant, and implant, unless the right. fertilized ovum can implant in the wall of the uterus, the pregnancy can't develop. So the voters, 65% said no. Was it, how was it, was it phrased one of those yes, no kind of things that sometimes you say? I don't, I don't remember. No, there was language, like every proposition had a little statement. And went right, but sometimes you have to say yeah, yes think, to say no. If I remember correctly, Proposition 14 was about if Roe v. Wade were overturned, oh, that, that abortion would be illegal in Rhode yeah, Island. Yeah. I see, right, and uh, the, the, it was quite clear, and if I read a quote from you somewhere how elated you were at the, in the time, I, yeah, you were elated after the, after yeah. the vote on Proposition 14. Well, yeah, because it, it, it's not the kind of thing that they're going to try to do every year, and so a victory like this is historic enough that it's a great milestone that you can build on and you can hope that it's the last time you have to go through this right. on that particular question. Do you feel that way now? I do. I mean, listen, I think by now, um, the pro-choice majority in Rhode Island has made itself heard. They're powerful. There are all kinds of politicians who are with us. There are big donors to campaigns who are with us. And those are the kind of people who really decide what happens. Are you as optimistic, Barbara? Well, I'm optimistic about Rhode Island, but about the rest of the country, I'm very pessimistic. I mean, the, the genius of the Texas law that was passed, which is very draconian, is it the state has nothing to do right. with it, it, this is citizens can sue abortion providers right and um, and have and have. already I think. Yeah. and so how many doctors are going to be willing to do abortions in Texas knowing that they're going to get sued immediately and that's a very time-consuming and expensive proposition so you know, I think it's evil genius, but I think it was a genius whoever thought that up. Right. Uh, going back to Roe Wade, um, did the Hyde Amendment, which restricted Medicaid for paying for abortions, is that was that a big deal for you? Well, At Planned Parenthood? It, it was a big justice issue, uh, and it was certainly a big deal to the poor women, uh, low-income women, who were cut out of the possibility. But, you know, we did abortions on women who were covered by the government or would have been, who couldn't then get the payment. Right. And we used to just do the abortions anyway. And you financed it yourself, basically. Yeah, we, we wrote right. those off or whatever. Or there were actually sometimes donors who gave money for that fund to cover those costs. So, and that's what I did when I worked at preterm abortion clinic in Washington. I volunteered there. So, it was so they took there the wasn't money that, that they chart. saved by not having to pay me and used it to fund abortions for poor right. women. Right. And, you know, Abortion laws are not only inherently sexist, they're inherently racist. Because before abortion was legalized, the death rate from illegal or self-induced abortions was 12 times higher in non-white women than it was in white women. Really? Wealthy white women could always fly off somewhere and get an abortion. Hmm. It's the poor women, the minority women, um, who were most likely to die because they had to put themselves in the hands of back alley butchers. Or try to do it themselves. Or try to do it Which themselves. is worse. Right. You know, uh, one thing uh, Tommy and I were talking about before the show is, so uh, my only real experience with this fight was walking my dog down Point Street when there was a demonstration going on. And, uh, and you know, and I would say things and stuff. But Tommy, you had a case where well, you just lost it one day, I, right? Well, I, I was driving by and traffic was really slow, so I got to see what was going on. There was a woman trying to get into the clinic and the protesters with signs were yelling and they were holding up the signs of butchered babies and they were like marching around her and she got really frightened. I think she slipped in the cement and she fell down and okay. she was lying on the cement and the protesters were on top of her, like the signs and they were like really scaring her. And I yelled out the window of the car, leave that girl alone, leave that girl alone. And they turned and they started chasing my car. They came after me, and I got really scared. I just took off, and I went right through the red light because I didn't want to be. <laughs> you know, Marianne had already left Planned Parenthood when, when one day Barbara Baldwin was the executive director, and there was one particularly obnoxious man. And until he realized that I was, you know, going to not take it from him, I, he would be trying to, you know, talk me in because I was young then. I, I looked like I might be a patient, and they would uh, try and talk me in, and I would get right in their face as if I was going to take them, and then I would start screaming at them, 
words that I can't use on television, <laughs> basically telling them what they could do with <laughs> their yeah. beliefs yes. as fetus fetishes. And what happened then? They then quiet they down? Would, then they would, you know, get scared. What but kind then of lady there was is one this? particular guy who was so persistent that one day he kept following me and shouting at me and yelling at me, and I, and I just had had it. So I, I climbed up one or two steps of the clinic, and I leaned over and I mooned him. And Barbara Bowen would say, <laughs> oh, Barbara, God. you can't do that. You can't do that. You, have to yes, keep her, you had to keep her he in line. That was off. part of your job there. He right? took <laughs> off as if I had pulled a gun on him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you. Uh, that's what was you it were like, there. Marianne and, and and Barbara? What was it like being inside when that was going on outside? Well, when we were on Westminster Street, we were on the third floor, and they were down in the street. That's so better. we, you know, we didn't really yeah. see them. But um, the only thing I remember about those people that were always outside our door was one day I got so sick of them because they were passing out St. Christopher medals or some saint, I think, I don't know what saint it was, but they were passing out these medals. So I said to one, some, one of the staff members, I don't remember who, probably Barbara, <laughs> she would come with me, Cavallaro. I said, come on, let's go downstairs. And we bought a big basket full of condoms. And they were passing out the medals, and we were behind them passing it. And I'd, I said, listen, if that doesn't work as birth control, this will. And then we just passed these out. That so you, you have to try to make, you know. That would have been great video. Yeah, right. See, and today everyone would have their phone. Yeah, right. And everyone, Somebody would have taken everyone, that Everyone, the whole world would know that. Yeah, you, right. you people would be. Right. Are they still picketing now? Well, we'll get to that, but not as easy, right? Well, again, I'm not the director there, and I, I don't really know what goes on at the Point mm -hmm. Street thing. But yeah, they, I know they've still had picketers because I know men, Cynthia's husband volunteered, Bob, as an escort. They had to have ma male volunteers to take care of the males that were trying to keep the women yeah. out of the clinics. So. But one of the things I think we can talk about in the next segment is um, from an architectural viewpoint standpoint, moving across the street from Crossroads on Broad Street there, I guess it's the old Girl Scout headquarters, is a, is a night and day if, if the experience for anybody having to get in and out of that building and do business in the building as opposed to Point Street. Yeah. You know, yeah. That was a good, a good thing from anyone who's working or going there, oh, I would good. think. <laughs> We're glad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. At the end, uh, at the beginning of the next and final segment of the Tommy Rocket Show with Barbara, Marianne, and Peter. So stay tuned. I propose three cheers for those we leave behind. Congratulations. Good job. Congratulations. Proud of you. All right. Anson Elliott. Who's going to salute them? <laughs> Guys, who gets to salute them first? <laughs> Hi, welcome back to the fourth and final segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. Peter, where were we? Uh, you know, I think we were on the, the sidewalk on Point Street, but I, um, you know, I, I wanted to move along to a very important thing that happened uh, two years ago in Rhode Island passed the Reproductive Health Act, yeah. I guess it was called, in 2019. And in all the accounts of that law, it what said it, it, was, it was codifying Roe v. Wade in Rhode Island. Uh, so does that mean that choice, the fight for choice is settled in Rhode Island? Is it over? I don't think so because, it, it, you know, the opposition is never going to say, you know, uncle. And so you can put out what you feel is the perfect law and get it passed. Um, and there's always going to be the next challenge. As Barbara just pointed out, they've deputized any human being that can speak to be a, a litigant. In Texas. So, no, right. here in Rhode Island, too. I mean, they, 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 we're going down the same road as Texas, so they'll eventually say the same things. And people are going to start to file suits and you know, whatever they do. Uh, this is an endless war, I think. Why? Because the convictions are so deep on both sides. The, you know, I'm not, I don't disrespect my opposition in the sense that I know that most of them, I mean, there are wacky people on both sides, but the truly committed, intelligent, uh, so-called right to life person, advocate, she or he, mostly she, she believes just as deeply that she's right 
as I believe that I am. And I was really close to Anna Sullivan, who was the head of the Constitutional Right to Life in Rhode Island, who unfortunately passed away. Um, close, you mean personally close? Well, I mean, we didn't have dinner together every week, but I had a relationship with her, so much so that when, at the end of her life, when she was ill, and I didn't know that she was, I got a call. We lived in Tiverton then, and this woman said, is this Mary Ann from the radio? And I said, well, I'm not on the radio now, but this is Mary Ann. And she said, hi, I'm a friend of Anna Sullivan's, and I know that you're a friend of hers, too. And I said, well, I like to think we're friends. What's, what's wrong? And she said that she was very ill. And she, I understood that it was going to be the end of her life. And I just thought you'd like to know, she said. So I said, well, I won't call her house because I don't think that's appropriate. But I write to Anna. So I wrote to Anna and said, you know, I understand you're not well. And I know that your daughter's getting, I, her friend told me the daughter's getting married and the mother's not going to the wedding. So I knew it was really that's serious. serious yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, I realized in that exercise that this was my only real friend from the opposition because I respected her because she was sincere and Anna was the only uh, anti-choice advocate that I know who did something positive. She had this service where she not only visited women who were pregnant and alone and going through it on their own and whatever and maybe questioning whether or not, but she had a maternity hope chest and she used to go bring them baby clothes and food and things. You know, that's really commitment. Mm -hmm. It's not just blowing off hot air. So I really respected her and I miss her. Right. Uh, so a lot of the demonstration on October 2nd had to do with Texas and uh, Texas, I maybe primarily, but there's also a very restrictive law in Mississippi, correct? So, so um, And the, the Mississippi law is being challenged, and if I have this correct, and I think I do, the Supreme Court will hear the Mississippi case in the fall or make their ruling in the fall, and that's what all the, I call them the fetus fetishists. The anti-choice people, they're not pro-life, they're fetus fetishists, they're anti-women. That's the one they're pinning their hopes on for overturning Roe v. Wade in this Supreme Court session. Um, so I'm very happy that no matter what the Supreme Court decides, it's been codified into law in Rhode Island. But, you know, I think at the basis of the opposition to abortion is fear of women's sexuality and hatred of women's sexuality. And all this business about, oh, it's, it's murder, it's taking human life. A fetus is no more human being than an acorn is an oak. But even if the fetus, or the sper to use the old Catholic teaching, the sperm itself could be defined as human, abortion should still be legal because anti-abortion laws give to the fetus rights which are not enjoyed by any human being in our society. No human being's right to life includes the right to live inside the body of another without their consent. <laughs> no human being's right to life includes the right to use any organ in that person's body without their consent. And yet a fetus uses not just the woman's uterus, lives inside the body, uses her lungs, uses her heart, uses her kidney, uses her liver. And if the woman doesn't want to be pregnant, then the fetus is doing that without her consent. So making abortion legalized does not portend the loss of rights for any group because any, no human being has the rights that anti-abortion laws give to the fetus. Mm -hmm. It's all about controlling women and controlling women's sexuality and controlling reproduction. Did, did you, you touched on, people have touched on that theme. Did you touch on that theme in this last the Women's March? Uh, no, because I, you know, I use that when I'm debating the fetus fetishists. I see. I was preaching to the choir. I mean, this, this, um, the thing that made me very happy about the, the, uh, the demonstration on October 2nd was that the organizers were young women. And, and there were a lot. And there were lots of them. And one of, the, one, of the things I, one of the things I talk about when I'm talking about my memoir is that young women today have no idea what it was like to be growing up and mm -hmm. to be a young woman in the pro Roe v. Wade era. And we've touched about the horrors that you know yes. people we knew personally went through. They have no idea, but they see the threat, and they're organizing. Now, do I, how do they how do they greet and treat you? I wonder what does that feel like. Uh, it's it's very um, 
gratifying because many of them are really serious about their respect for you because of the work that you did. Mm -hmm. And they go turn themselves inside out to say thank you and mm -hmm. and they're trying their best to keep the fires burning mm -hmm. and keep the movement going. So it's it's really gratifying to be with these young women and the men who support them. Mm -hmm. I love I like to mention the men all the time because it must not be easy to you know put yourself in the middle mm -hmm. of a 200 women screaming about their reproductive <laughs> rights and you're there, you know. So um, I'm I'm yeah. grateful to the men. Support. The young women were were very kind to me because um, I think I was scheduled to speak at 4.15. Now, at 8.30 in the morning, I, sh I went to, I've been volunteering for the Rhode Island Medical Reserve Corps doing COVID vaccinations. So you report for work, and I'm, we were doing a drive-through clinic at the Wickford train station parking lot. And between 9 and 10.30, a couple of us did 120 vaccinations. And so like, boom, 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 boom. It was, it was kind of exhausting. Mm. And so then I went home, you know, I showered, I got up to um, Providence for the demonstration. I got there about 1.30. And I said to one of the organizers, I said, you know, Alexandra, um, I hate to ask you this, but could you move me up in the order of speeches? Because I'm closer to 80 than 70, and I'm, just, <laughs> I'm already very tired mm -hmm. from doing all these vaccinations. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, no problem at all. They actually had me speak first. And I was very grateful because I knew by 4.15 I would be Snap hitting the time. wall and you know, yeah, I'd be falling asleep <laughs> at the podium. Mm -hmm. So, How many people turned out? I think there were at least 600 or so. I was going to say, they filled it, you know the park across the street from the Supreme Court on South Main Street? Yes. yes. It was full. Uh, That's a big space. You, and it was a march from the State House to? No, from Providence Place Mall. Oh, the mall. Oh, yeah. Down to Down the, Memorial Drive. Right, it was, was like a mile, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, I didn't see any, any anti-choice people. Huh. No, I didn't either. And it wasn't that it was a secret that no. we were no. going to do this. So. No. Although I have to say the Projo didn't have anything about it, either before or after. Well, that's yeah. another matter. There yeah. was a demonstration the previous night for the anti-vaxxers. They got a crowd for that. <laughs> yeah, I think there's an intersection between some of those people. I'm there's a woman with a megaphone who, who walks up and down outside the Wickford train station every Saturday trying to talk people out of getting their vaccinations or get tested. Oh. Does she give a reason? Like, I, I, you know, I don't listen. Oh. So the Texas, what makes Texas interesting is that the state, to get around Roe Wade, decided they were going to deputize every citizen. In the state? Yeah, Texas. So, so, right, how did that, I mean, well, how does that work? What they, all they did was say that, you know, people, regular people can bring charges. Have standing. Right. Even if you're not involved in the abortion, just anybody. No, they. I think there has to be some. Like you two could both get sued in Texas. Yeah. If the Texas law was, if you were still. And probably the, some guy who doesn't want to have his wife or girlfriend have a termination at a clinic that we might could be. Could sue his. Right. To he, stop. He, he could be the. He could be the. But I mean, he, random people are bringing suit right. in Texas. They have no. Nothing to do, no relationship with the provider or the patient or anything else. Now a lot of people um, who have been in this this history that we've been talking about are very worried about the Supreme Court. Do you share that worry? Well, you know, Chief Justice, the Chief Justice has been a surprise in that he's been more uh, progressive than we thought he might be. And now I'm starting to get worried about him because I think that there's enough chatter about it that he may feel that he's got to pull back. And, you know, and if we lost that vote, that would be really devastating. So you're worried about the Mississippi case? Yeah, I'm, I'm worried. I'm always worried because, you know, this is none of the abortion laws that we have had and, and that have stuck are ever on really firm ground because the opposition is endless in size. It's endless in commitment. It's endless in financing because it's got all these churches behind it. Mm. I mean, they're, they're there and they're never going away. So you always have to worry. Now how you can they use you, the, oh, excuse me, Tom, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, how can they use the church behind them? Is there supposed to be a separation between church and law? Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean Catholics can't lobby, can't go out in demonstrations and okay, give sorry, money to causes. organizations and things. Mm -hmm. uh, during one of the breaks, you said you wanted to address the Yes, diocese. I was just going to ask you. Oh. Because we have three minutes left, so. Well, I just, I just want to know when, you know, 
there's all this discussion about the, the sanctity of human life and the fetuses and where this abortion discussion is concerned. But the church today, in today's headlines, ought to be forced to justify how it can remain so silent on the already born children who are every day by the dozens and the thousands being sexually abused by priests. Now, that's really a problem because there's no question about these uh, alive children. They're not fetuses. And, you know, they need to just look in the mirror and, and, and answer for that because it's scandalous and it's terrifying, it's disgusting, it's inhumane, and most of all, it's contradictory given how they come after it's the rest criminal. of us. It's criminal. Do you exactly. think this... Uh, Pope Francis has made any uh, s sort of a movement toward addressing your question? The best I can say about Pope Francis is that when someone else, I can't say this on the air, with more testicular fortitude than he has, uh, does something, like some cardinal or somebody important starts to a movement and makes a decision, that's really good for the progressive Catholic. Then, Francis likes to take advantage of that high moment in his administration and take credit almost for it. But he doesn't initiate a lot of stuff himself. Mm -hmm. So I don't expect much from him. So that's your question to the church, basically. Well, uh, my mm -hmm. question for the church is, you know, why don't you spend more time looking in the mirror and defending your own sexual abuses of children and lay off the women who have decisions to make that are private? Sounds good to me. I, uh, we got one minute left. Would anybody like to add anything that they think is interesting or important to tell the audience that they can say in a, a minute or two? Peter? Every, everybody who's listening to a show like this needs to do uh, some simple stuff to be effective citizen in the state of Rhode Island. Learn who your representatives are at the state house, your senator and your rep. Write down their name, address, phone number, email, whatever. You got a beef, you write to them, you call them, you haunt them. It's very important to lobby. And you can do it, and it's very helpful to the people like us who are trying to represent issues that you care about. And a lot of other issues could be food stamps, could be your kids' schooling, whatever. Haunt them. And vote. And vote. Find out whether or not the people you're voting for are pro-choice or anti-choice and vote accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. All important things for our audience to know. And I can't thank you enough, both of you, for coming here and you know, giving such pleasure. great information and sharing your beliefs with our audience. Peter, once again, a great interview. And I want to thank the uh, viewing audience in Rhode Island for watching The Tommy Rocket Show. And stay tuned. And thank you so much. So slip inside this funky house Oh, dishes in the sink, the TV's in the